you can be as strict, you can have fines for food waste, whatever. The issue or the largest impact that we can do is ourselves. Because at home, we decide what there is in the fridge, especially with stuff that has a very short shelf life. If we want to tackle food waste, we do not have a good and bad food waste. Welcome to Revivin, where environmental ideas come to life. At Revivin, we aim to connect, learn, and make a difference. So to get started, do you just want to tell us who you are, who your team is, and how you got started? I'm very happy to be here. My name is Oliver. I am 29 years old, and I come here from the region of Basel. I am today here for Lev. <laughs> The Brutal Lokale Glasse, the brutally local ice cream, which is a term coming from the United States, <laughs> to really show it's not only regional, because regional is quite a kind of a buzzword, but to say we only source local. We initially started with just regional produce, the plum, for example, uh, when we started in 2021. But a few customers came, where is the vanilla? <laughs> Why don't you guys have chocolate? <laughs> And out of that, and out of a connection to Werkstätte here in Basel, who save, Sonja Grassin saves food waste, we realized there is potential here, first of all. And secondly, we can use it to promote the awareness of food that gets thrown away. And out of that, we are now going 50-50 with the ice cream. For example, we have strawberries from Binningen, Dottmingen. But as well, for example, here rose the banana that would have been thrown away because of the dark spots. We can dive into food waste afterwards mm -hmm. specifically. And the plums are from Muttens, and they were too small to be harvested and to go into retail. And the idea out of it was just to do something that is first of all fun and not scolding. Because mm -hmm. I think if we want to change something, it's best if there's a positive incentive within the frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so you have a team of, is it five right now? Yes, we are five. We met through hospitality. Um, we have two professional chefs, one patissier. Two of them are now studying food science, respectively food technology. I'm just, I'm a talkative person. I was, <laughs> I was a waiter for all my studies, but I studied uh, law and public policy. So this is how we met. We going through the grind of founding a company, but still not forgetting the impact we want to reach. Because I think with a company that has to make profit out of nature of the company itself, it's always a main task to don't forget where you have to, where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And since we're, you alluded to it, the food waste, do you want to kind of dive into that a bit for us? We were just having a side conversation. <sighs> I was like, Oh, this is so interesting. So you definitely have the background in it. And we pulled some statistics, but I think if you're able to bring light to this, then it would be really beneficial. So maybe we break down the food waste that you know of that exists within either Basel or all of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So food waste is quite a big term. We are talking about 2.8 million tons per year. That's 330 kilograms per person per year. That's a daily calorie intake of 1,100 kilocalories. Just within Switzerland? Just within Switzerland. Obviously, it's, it's a luxury problem in the sense that I have a statistic from, not sure if it's Nigeria, but obviously, if you don't spend that much money relatively to your income on food, your incentive to sort of really take it is lower. But what is food waste? I mean, we all know the carrots in your fridge that sort of starts to be a bit wobbly <laughs> and you slightly disgusted with it and you feel ashamed that it's rotting away but it's much more than that I, it's, I think food waste itself is very behind the curtain because we don't get to realize it we have November now and the strawberry season in Switzerland is over so that means the portal for import strawberries is open again mm -hmm. and retailers just around the corner they order food or fruits quite in advance, say two weeks. But they do never know how much consumption or how much people buy within the shelf life that we have for a strawberry. So as soon, and even then, even if it's perfectly fine, if the next truck is coming on Tuesday, you have to throw it away anyways. So there are different approaches 
towards it. Um, in uh, the Sustainability Goals 2030, we pledged Switzerland global community to reduce food waste by 50% until 2030. And this is where we stand now. The companies have, within the framework, are able to take voluntary measures until 2025, 26, and the Federal Council will decide or will do an evaluation, does that work or will there be stronger measures? Mm -hmm. But even counting food waste is so difficult because there is not the food waste pope that <laughs> sort of looks at you all and say, <laughs> says, where is that food waste? So yeah, all in all, I think it's complex. I hope that brought yeah. it a bit. Absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned the phrase, we read this, I think, on your website. You talk about conscious consumption. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? We are an ice cream company. Yeah. We put sugar <laughs> in our produce because it's ice cream. Yeah. Is it part of our nutrition to eat ice cream? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Does it have place for us personally within our healthy diet? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that is just the first. That's out of the business center of, of sugar as a non-healthy or very high caloric energy ingredient. For us, as I said before, we're not here to scold. Ice cream is fun. That's why we're called love, right? It's from love and we want to bring joy. We want to bring fun. That's why for us, the vessel of ice cream makes sense because it has to be as well aesthetic. Mm -hmm. If you talk about food waste and the, the wobbly uh, carrot that I was talking before, you are not willing, you're not looking forward to eat it. That's why the term food waste is negative because it's not waste, as, at least until a certain moment. Mm -hmm. And therefore... What I would love to, or for me myself, and I sometimes when I'm very hungry, I forget it, is to eat something, be it a salty meal, be it something sweet, to be able to realize what it is, mm -hmm. what is behind it, because we lost connection mm -hmm. to food. Yeah, I totally agree with you in that regard. And that's something that Robert and I do with nature and we try to highlight in our books is that people have stepped away from the natural world. We're now... Um, been coined an urban species and so less and less people are living in the land connected to how their food grows harvesting the food having a great appreciation for it so i think what you say about conscious consumption is not only understanding where the food comes from but a lot of what we consume has a long journey before it gets to us it's very different than when you go in a back garden and you pick a carrot and i think when there's something when you plant something, you watch it grow, and then you're more inclined to consume it because there's a deep respect for it because you were part of the process. So I think that's really important to come back to for sure. With your ingredients, can you tell us where you get the ingredients? And then uh, Robert and I were talking about this. We we're like, okay, so let's say you get bananas. Obviously, you need to use them. How do you quickly do you have to use them? Do you have to freeze them? How quickly are you producing product once you get this food that would otherwise be in the garbage? So it really depends. Um, within a seasonal frame, as I was mentioning before, the strawberries, the strawberry season is between end of May until July. Mm -hmm. Within that frame, we're quite able just, we take it in whatever we can do, even if it's, so the shelf life is getting more shorter. Mm -hmm. And then we usually, we cut it. And if we do not use it directly, we freeze it. Um, with other things, we got the offer of two tons of Sanddorn. That's buckthorn in English. Wow. And it's a very vitamin C high berry. It's a very complex taste. It's sweet, it's sour, and a hint of bitter. It really feels healthy. <laughs> I'm not sure if that really goes well with ice cream, but that's, that's a completely other point. And we had to decide, sort of, and this is quite difficult in the sense you have to decide quickly, as you mentioned, and then where you want to store it, because storage is probably one of the key factors of ice cream, because with fruits, we cannot just dry it and keep it in the corner. And we have uh, local partners, for example, uh, Sonja Gresslin from Werkstätte. She founded um, initially an association, but it's now a GmbH, and she saves food professionally. She has work integration, and then I think she does as well marmalade. Mm -hmm. But coming back to my initial statements, 2.8 million tons a year. You can do a lot of marmalade <laughs> with that. <laughs> yeah. And out of that, to sort of, I think they're different enablers in that sense. She is a professional food saver. We produce ice cream professionally. 
And even if we use food waste and try to raise awareness, we are not able to simultaneously produce it and source it because, and people always ask me, food waste, that must be cheap, man. Yeah. And we decided we do not pay for food waste if we use it because that would make us part of the problem as an incentive of, ah, let's order one, 200 tons more of strawberry on a larger scale. But if a partner like Sonia and her crew, for example, cut pineapples for us, we pay the work mm. for it because that makes sense, mm-hmm. but not to buy it. So therefore, and secondly, sourcing food waste is time consuming. Mm-hmm. So it's not, it's not cheaper. It's probably on a, on a strictly man, um, money base. It's maybe a bit cheaper, but and that's, I think, impact, right? You have to take the extra step. And it's not about the profit itself. Mm-hmm. But you're continuously looking for more and different waste all the time, right? Because you only have a finite amount of, let's say, product that you're working with at any given time, right? I think it's more the connection. I mean, the source itself, as I said, it's, it's incredibly big. More, it's, more than you could make all the <laughs> More than we all could make. I mean, it's one third of all food that is wasted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, if you have the connection to it... Mm-hmm then there's a inf- almost an infinite amount of it. But you have to produce it. And I think especially around 50% of food waste is produced or gets wasted at our homes. Wobbly carried again. Mm-hmm. Because there is no one, there is no incentive, there is no money. You just bought it and you had a busy week and the fell is sticking to the fridge because it started to get frozen. And you just don't feel like it anymore or you did too much meal prep. Me, for example, I did lentils this week and I was not that happy with the result. So and I ate it twice and I have another portion of it and it just sits there in the fridge and tells me, eat me. But I am, yeah, yeah. you know where I, exactly. what I mean. Exactly. And this is why it's so important. You can be as strict, you can have fines for food waste, whatever. The issue or the largest impact that we can do is ourselves because at home we decide what there is in the fridge especially with stuff that has a very short shelf life Mm -hmm. i was reading a statistic on the translation in english is the office of environment and energy and they were saying that it would take the whole canton of zurich to produce the amount of food that is thrown away each year in switzerland did you read this do you know this (laughs) but for me that was a visual like the entire canton is we could fill that with food with what we're getting rid of so that i think sometimes when you think of a visual it's really that was impactful for me and then with your flavors how do you come up with your flavors is it exclusively based on what you're sourcing from sonia is it from what you're asking local partners or farms to contribute do you have a standard are you always changing so this was our third season Mm -hmm. now it's november and it's slightly more calm um, we go with the season, first of all. So we start with rhubarb, then comes strawberry. Within the summer comes Steinfrüchte. So that's apricots, that's plums or cherries. And on top of that, because food waste has no seasonality, so 200 kilos of pineapple do not magically appear at the end of April. So <laughs> it's always about flexibility. Mm-hmm. for us but as well within the cups for people for our, our b2b customers to have the flexibility so we are standing here and say you have we, you can trust us we have a high quality ice cream it's always delicious but it can change and i'm not sure exactly how we're going to do that in the future mm-hmm. because if we can take stuff in larger bulks it's, I mean, it's not we're not talking about hey i have five kilos of oranges in my in my fridge you want to take it because that is not it's not economically viable but if we can say for example from a retailer i have 500 kilos of pineapple because not at the end store but maybe in the main um, logistics Mm -hmm. center Mm -hmm. then we can produce it or prepare it in a large quantity and be able to have more longer flavors but the production itself is both so it's coming from what is available and as well what is tasty mm-hmm. for us. And sometimes that works, very wonderful. So our chocolate ice cream, it's with uh, obviously with food waste chocolate, 100% cooking chocolate that just, people don't eat that that much. We want that milk in it. <laughs> and it's our best selling ice cream. Hmm. And the food that you're sourcing, is it primarily fruits or do you get a, a broad spectrum? Did you 
I remember maybe this was at Impact Hub the first time we saw you speak, but I think you had something with tomato or basil. <laughs> I'm not talking about our tomato vodka. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was at the <laughs> swim bath at the public pool, and I don't know why, but our very genius production head decided, okay, we saved tomatoes. And instead of doing something else, maybe a tomato soup that doesn't have to be ice cream, he decided as a challenge, let's do a tomato vodka, so a Bloody Mary sorbet. And I was on a Sunday, <laughs> Sunday afternoon, in the public pool, 32 degrees. I am scooping, I'm running, slightly sweaty, but smiling, obviously, because I'm selling ice cream. And there's this reddish thing on the side of our truck, and someone comes up, what is that? Uh, <laughs> because I was just a bit scared. Huh? And this person insisted of trying it. This person did not buy an ice cream afterwards. <laughs> because it's just, it's very challenging. And I think it's very interesting, sort of, so the intellectual ice cream consumption, asparagus, you name it, whatever. But most people are not willing to be that stimulated. <laughs> When you just want to have an ice cream on yeah. a Sunday afternoon when it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's, you have to find a balance between being curious, mm -hmm. wanting to try something new and realizing that you are a company mm -hmm. and you need to sell that stuff. Yeah. Sometimes hard. We, I thought a lot about it. So Impact Driven is a company the right vessel because, yeah, as I said, you need people to be interested in, even if you're an association, even if you're non-profit. People have to be interested in what you do mm -hmm. yeah. to create change. Yeah. Oh. And I think at the end of the day, even if what you're doing is altruistic or good, you still need to have some type of monetary <laughs> reimbursement for it because you have to live. So yeah, that's totally understandable. And this might be a, a question that we should have asked in the beginning. But it's something we were talking about is that I when we did a bit of research on Sonia's organization, is it Vert? Vert? Vert, Vert. Yeah, um, they, they upcycle and we read that they do a lot with chutneys, sometimes jams, juices. Why did you go in the direction of ice cream? I think it's fun. I agree with Pure you. Pure fun. <laughs> okay. Um, we initially started as a chef's table. Mm -hmm. So once a month, a room full of 12 people that do not know each other with a menu surprise. Hmm. One of our team members opened a restaurant just like that in January, but we're not naming it today. You can ask me later. Okay. <laughs> and that was 2019. And it went well. It was just for fun. Association. We were able with the money that we found it just to collect or to pay the bills, but it was just for, for us mm -hmm. to show something else, to show the value of regional and local produce. And then 2020 came and there was no chef's table anymore <laughs> because... COVID. And I think in early spring, after the lockdown or before, no, I forgot it, mm -hmm. we saw a small ice cream machine, one meter high and two, two and a half thousand francs. And we said, let's buy it. And during summer, we're going to make gelato. Mm -hmm. Not for the sake of gelato, but just that we have the ice cream machine because in winter, when COVID is over, and imagine if we can produce some sorbet, you know, oh, pineapple, no, no, or even basil, basil. Basil sorbet is very nice. Okay. And then we were sitting there in St. Johann the whole summer, Saturday, Sunday, playing chess and sometimes scooping ice cream for people that bypassed. And the feedback was very lovely. And mm. we it gave us some, first of all, some sense after just the boredom and to try something new. And out of that, we decided let's, let's continue. And we evolved. Initially, we just had this small stand. We did the crowdfunding with an ice cream bicycle, which you can drive around. Maybe you saw it. And yeah, so it's, I think the journey, whatever happens with it or whatever happens so far, I think doing something new, mm. it's fun. Yeah. yeah, it's a challenge. A challenge. Yeah. yeah, but you know, the ice cream machine, whether you believe in serendipity or not, but sometimes I think in life, if we're open, like you saw this and you thought, okay, well, let's just see what we can do with this, you know? And so look at where you are now. Absolutely. I think that's so cool, right? Uh, yeah, this naivety, this small, yeah, looking at it, maybe not always thinking, okay, what is the third step after my choice now? Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> yeah. obviously 
some things can go bad and I, I am happy that I not always just stumble into something like that. But every now and then, I think it's lovely Yeah. to just be uncomfortable because, hey, stupid me <laughs> decided yeah. to do that and that. No, but I, I think it's very lovely to, to try something new wherever you are, right? It can be small, can be big, doesn't matter that much. Yeah, and sometimes it can lead to the greatest opportunities of our life or even expose us to people we would have never, otherwise never met. I think our whole life has been built on the fact of being uncomfortable, We're truly. Moving here, <laughs> not knowing anything, <laughs> and then just this whole cascading of, okay, well, let's just do it. We don't know the outcome, but let's give it a try. And obviously it's worked quite well for you, which is nice, yeah. I mean, you, you were talking about food waste and kind of how you create different menus and what's the cycle time? I mean, if you come up with a new food item that's wasted, how long does it take you to create a new flavor or to use it in some way? I mean, you've been doing it several years. Maybe you have a process already. So that's a good question. Um, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> this was our third season. And for some things, we know how to do it as soon as we get it. So for example, the chocolate, it's always, it's an evolution. We change on the on the sugar intake or on the level of chocolate that we put in, but it always it's an evolution. It's not re a revolution in the sense that we have to come up with something new. It's I would say it go, can be between two days and up to a, a month mm -hmm. to come up with it. But we do batch style, so we do not test something and then throw it out because food waste, right? <laughs> so. It's very nice that Philip, he has a, he's a trained uh, patissier, so a dessert chef, and mm -hmm. he's responsible for it. So he's, he has the knowledge and the intuition mm -hmm. to be able to, even if it's not perfect for his mind yet, it's great for me. I mean, as a gelato layperson, right? <laughs> and then afterwards, the next step or the next batch that we do will improve. Mm -hmm. But it's already, if you have the baseline that is already nice, mm -hmm. it's easier to start with because you cannot just stand in front of the whiteboard and never do anything. Mm -hmm. But it depends what we can get. And the, the buckthorn was a special case, for example, this summer, because usually what you see in the retail is as well produce that is potentially within our influence. Mm -hmm. It's not just an exotic, it's not a star fruit or a dragon fruit that all of a sudden appears in, in a ton. Or at least not for, not for now. So, yeah. Hmm. You touched upon this, and I thought it was a really important topic, but somebody asked you if you see yourselves moving in the way of organic. And I thought your response was really good. And the reason I say that is because I think, and I'll use the example as Patagonia, when they first started, they really had no idea of the industry. And as they evolved, they realized there was so much damage that was created by the clothing and outdoor retail industry. And so they have, throughout their 50 years of existence, really made steps. And they've been incremental steps to move into a better direction. Are they perfect? No. Do they claim they're perfect? No. Are they aware that these problems exist? Yes. And so I think that is really a beautiful foundation for creating a company that wants to have a positive impact. And so when someone asked you this the other night, uh, I'll let you answer with, will you move in the area of organic and why not? Food waste, right? Are we that picky that we decide that we only want to use organic food waste? <laughs> so it's about yeah. the impact. There are different issues or quite a few. We are a handmade, high quality ice cream. Obviously the, the next step will be to do it organic. But organic food, especially here. So we could say the strawberries that we get or the rhubarb that we get in early spring from the season, we only do that organic. So, but we said we are brutally local, right? To come back to this, to this term, what does that mean? We want to have it from the region here. Mm -hmm. And in a future step, I could see myself having organic, because obviously organic food is better than non-organic food. It's not that much of a big brainer, but it's about cost efficiency to be able that people want to buy the ice cream and if we have already that much intensity towards the goal we need to have a large scale to be able to to survive to reinvest and that people don't feel like hey i'm not buying an ice cream for eight francs 50 as a cup so i would say in the future maybe yes but it will not be completely obviously because mm -hmm. if we want to tackle food waste we do not have a good and bad food waste mm -hmm. And you also alluded to the fact that your sorbets are vegan. 
And someone asked you about that, and I thought that was also very good, that you talked about the fact that for you and for your team, it seems like you're really interested in producing a product that is delicious. And so someone said, will you be going into the vegan sector? And I'll let you respond to what you said, because I thought it was also very good. (laughs) We are trying or we are experimenting with the vegan chocolate ice cream. So the sister or the brother to our now chocolate ice cream. And what I don't like yet about vegan cream ice cream <laughs> is this, this sensation at my tongue, at the back side of the tongue, when it's watery. Because cream or dairy as itself has more creamy texture. So you feel it, it's, it's very creamy and you don't get that water feeling. And for me personally, I would then come out with a vegan line when that issue is solved <laughs> because it's about taste. And I'm, if you guys, I mean, I don't have anything about the vegan ice cream. It's just this, the last thought for myself to say the best and sorbets have are mandatory vegan since 1971 in Switzerland because yeah <laughs> but it's not water ice cream that's the biggest uh, issue or big difference it's not the rocket because a lot of people think sorbets that's it's nothing is just water and sugar but it's not it's a lot of fruit and yeah so in in the long term yes we will have vegan maybe we go fully fully vegan but for the moment now it was as well the brutally local, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's always if you wanna if your framework is quite small, there's not that much vegan milk <laughs> in our sort of yeah. thirty minute kilometers radius. But now we uh, you have the first step on it. I think we will find a solution for that. But it has to be great. It mm-hmm. doesn't have to be okay. We're vegan because people have to like us in the sense of we are so conscious because we are ice cream. Let's be honest. Eh? That this is not. This is a highly intensive frozen treat. We will not solve that issue with the produce itself because it's very high intensive. Mm, yeah. And I think you can see that it's very it's very complex, right? Because you want to prevent food waste. You want to source brutally locally. And so there are a lot of issues within it. Do you have more questions? No, but I, w- okay. I was thinking about the vegan aspect. It's like, is, is, it, is it the fat or something in the milk? And if yeah. that's the case, then... Could you use something like avocado or something else that's a natural fatty? So the thing is, there is enough <laughs> fat in in uh, vegan milk, mm-hmm. in the sense of in a substitution. For example, the best milk you can get in that sense is cashew, mm-hmm. cashew milk because it's it has enough fat. The thing is with with dairy, it's so naturally homogeneous, mm. right? It's not put together by humans, but due to other just milk right we all or most of us know the taste of milk and that's the issue of cream that it's so we have not yet reached this perfection mm. of meeting sort of the fluid and the oil that it doesn't feels like separation in our mouth mm-hmm. and think about me the next time you are in a, in a store and think about or buying <laughs> a vegan ice cream and th- really think when you when you take a, a spoon do you feel the watery sensation here mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe now we can just quickly pivot because I think this is really important to your packaging. And from my understanding, it's sustainable and what that means to you and why that's important to you. And then I'll just preface it by saying um, we go through this every summer with our kids when they want to buy ice cream in the summer and they always want to get the big tubs. And I'm always like, it's so much plastic. Like, what are we going to do with all that plastic? So I think it's really important to talk about your packaging, um, how you came up with it. Yeah, if you want to talk about that. Packaging and food is, it is what it is. Um, you all know the plastic around the cucumber in the store and you think it's bad, right? Packaging takes a very small percentage of the Umweltbelastungspunkte. <laughs> this is the environmental crushing points in the sense of how much environmental issue is produced out of one produce. And if the shelf life of the cucumber is reduced and we, we throw it away, is that worse than the plastic covering the cucumber itself? Because it prolongs the possibility of consumption. And food or the food itself is the most energy consuming part of food. It's not transport and it's not the package. That being said, after an event on Tuesday and I'm helping to clean up and I see 20, 30 of those, I don't feel like a champion because it's, it's, not, it's not lovely. But the cornet that we eat, so we have waffles now because in, that is very nice. In public spaces here in Basel, you're not allowed to use single use 
packages anymore for for events. So we have waffles, but uh, first of all, that's another 200 calories. <laughs> but, and secondly, it's very energy consuming. And I'm, I'm spinning a long answer. No, I'm sorry. Okay. No, it's <laughs> um, fine. And it's very is it more energy consuming to produce the waffle or this paper package? It's 99% paper. It's around 1% plastic. Out of legal terms, we can put that into the paper recycling. But you cleaned it? Yeah. So this is <laughs> perfectly fine. But for example, if you just have the rest of the sugar in it, you shouldn't really put it into the paper. So we decided to have the best option or not the worst in the sense we decided for paper so that it can be recycled. But it's not, I mean, it would be better to have the big cups. But then again, how do you reach people in the streets? You cannot always go with a five uh, deciliter cup. And so packaging is always an issue with food. And, I, I, and it always will. Uh, a few years ago, I saw sort of a, a st or a experiment with water being in sort of a, in a film, in a, in a bubble, yeah. And you can just take it directly. Ah, uh, yes. So yes. it's a consumable package, which is very interesting. But I'm not really sure. So it's protection, right? It's protection mm -hmm. for ourselves because it doesn't get spoiled. It doesn't come into contact with stuff we do not want in our ingestive system. So it's always this, this combination. Obviously, it would be best not to have that. But then again, no ice cream, right? So <laughs> no, yeah. I like ice cream. So yeah, in the future, someone asked me on the other week, how about um, new package um, technology? Maybe self-recyclable um, or with sort of um, organic plastic? Mm -hmm. Not sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But this is relatively new, right? So, and if whenever something is relatively new, that means it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And then again, we come back to the company. We have to survive as a company. And even if you have the best option for package for environmental reasons, that means we would have to increase costs or even be able to, to reach for it. So, as you said before with the Patagonia, incremental steps. We yeah. will change pa the packaging in the future. Mm -hmm. But as this is not our expert field, we are not on the forefront of that. Mm -hmm. So we have to wait until pricing is relatively lower, maybe more expensive than this one. That's not the issue, but it cannot be more than a certain level for us not to be dangerous as a company that has to survive. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask if anybody has any questions from the audience. Oh, yeah. yeah? A question from the audience. We talk always about sustainability and food waste. And what about your product? You told us you are in the third season and ice cream also has a due date, right? Or buy date. So is it already bought? You didn't have any product that has expired or what did you do with this product? So in general, there are two different dates. It's the minimal consumption date and the due date. And so for example, it's, it's the date you can, the latest you can sell it and the date you must have consumed it. And especially the second one, that's quite in the air, right? Because yeah. who knows, is it Tuesday, will it be Thursday? It depends if you cover it. And for us, we have now, initially we had a shelf life of around two months that we guaranteed, especially if you, for example, have a restaurant, we sell it to you and then you resell it. And then all of a sudden, first of all, it cannot go bad. As long as it's stored by at minus 18 degrees, it will not get mold or anything. The issue that it gets ice cream, and you know it all from our home, I'm very sure about it, it gets crystally. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it starts to sting your tongue, and it's not that nice, right? <laughs> and if you do that with the vanilla ice cream at your home, two months afterwards, and you have the urge, that's one thing, but we cannot sell that like that. So we have to provide, let's say, perfect product, especially, say, food waste. And we did have some ice cream left to answer your question. Finally, <laughs> buckthorn. <laughs> because, wow, it's not that easy to sell buckthorn. It's a strong flavor. <laughs> yeah, it's a strong flavor. People don't know it. So, And we had a few events. So, for example, this week, the pitch um, last week or a few weeks ago, we were at the food waste or food safe event to bank it for people to show off. So it's a dinner, three courses mm -hmm. to show what, what can be done. So on a, on a different, so the same mission that we have differently approached. And so we give it out, first of all, to, to maybe to people who do something nice and to be, hey, look, we don't want 
We don't want it to get wasted, so we eat it. And especially now during winter, we don't know how much we will sell over the winter because ice cream season is between April and September. And yeah, so we do not really throw ice cream away unless we have a freezer accident, which we did have last year. Mm. And that, that, is, that hurts because it's very intensive and something broke down with electricity and you show up in the morning and it's just a big soup of ice cream. And you cannot refreeze that. <laughs> that would be quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. Does anyone else have any other questions? A question from the audience. I totally love the whole concept and the approach towards this. What are the long-term plans? And typically we've seen so many companies with very, very noble missions going a particular mile and then being swallowed by these big guys. And then the ethos of the original company gets completely blended into the larger IPO dreams. You see, I mean this whole sustainability vision, I'm just not seeing this tied into the larger space and how impactful do you see this vision, say 10 years later as a founder? Where do you see this going? I have to be honest, I don't know. Because it's, I could say, I, when I came here, I thought to myself, okay, what is my picture of today? Will I be very self-confident? We gonna reach the sky, whatever. And we don't know, it's, it's a hardship, right? Because you're in different levels of life. You never really know what's, what's happening. If you want to have sort of investors, you, you have to be prepared. You have to overcome a certain fear of, is it good enough, mm -hmm. right? Because even if, if the story sounds great, I mean, it is great. And we had quite a lot of success. It's still, it's, it's very intense. And a lot of times you feel like you're not enough. And you, you did, I mean, it's ice cream. We produce it ourselves. It's very, logistics is, it's a nightmare. <laughs> because it's frozen, right? So in the future, if let's say Nestle would produce an ice cream made out of food waste, that would be lovely because 2.8 million tons in the sense of, of the impact. Food waste itself will, will change a lot in the future because compared to other food issues, no one, has, no one is a, um, an advocate for food waste because it means just costs. So in the future with, let's say, better, better data and better planning, you can reduce the amount. For ourselves, I'm not planning to be the largest ice cream handmade manufacturer in Switzerland because it's not it's not efficient enough, right? If you wanna if you wanna reach a certain scale, you have to be very efficient. And when we say we want to have a high quality ice cream made out of regional and, and food waste or food safe ingredients, there is absolutely, and that's fine because I'm not seeing myself to try to be the ice cream king of of Switzerland because sometimes there will be another issue but or another challenge but we want to create a sustainable company that has people that can work there all year around and make enough profit to survive because that's this is a space but it's a niche and I want it to be or we want it probably to be a niche because otherwise we need to change our DNA and Obviously, you can just make a high-quality ice cream, artisanal, and then go Swiss-wide. That's an option. But if we decide to co do this connection of ice cream and food waste, like we do it now, we will not, not even an IPO. Yeah. And an option, I think now, I'm, I'm not sure that we will even get an offer of a, of a bigger ice cream company to buy us because they want it to be efficient, because focus is profit and not finding creative ways for solutions, especially in a, in a sector as food where the margin is not, I mean, it's not... A comment from the audience. But with the whole ESG focus right now, a lot of the people are just doing plug-and-play things to look good, especially the bigger companies. They buy smaller ones, and they can picture them on their fancy books to show that they're doing something on this initiative and under the SDGs or whatever it be. They've ticked the box, and it is, it is happening. I see this quite a bit nowadays. Not necessarily to scale, but to showcase their CSR. Yeah, I see it happening more and more. Very interesting story. One of our best company segment, or what I say, maybe you are familiar with the concept of employer branding, and the whole pharmaceutical area in Basel has been or is a, um, a customer for, of us because as an event to show your employees, we care, right? We do something. And I realized that. And, and for us as a company, we have to take that chance because we profit out of that. I think you're absolutely right. Just trying to, you're scared. So you just buy stuff or you buy companies to show to be better. For us like that, if we can reach people. You've achieved your goal. Yes. Just drawing awareness, right? 
Yeah, because with ice cream, if, so if my main goal is to reduce food waste itself, ice cream, as you said, with, the, with shelf life is not the best vessel. But if you want to combine it, so this year in total, we used or we saved almost three tons of food waste in three years. Sounds a lot, but compared again to the 2.8 million, it's not even a drop on a hot stone. But to raise awareness with it, because it's, mm -hmm. it's nice, it's not scolding, that is, that is the main issue. Or that's why the ice cream for us is a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's a fun way to educate mm -hmm. and bring awareness. Yeah. yeah. I think it's so nice um, talking to you because two things. One, I feel like I, I haven't had the privilege to meet your whole team and sit down and speak with them, but I've spent some time now with you today and <laughs> just talking to you the other night. But it's very obvious to me that you are trying to do the right thing. And you're very aware that there are obstacles to doing that and that there will be areas that you can't maybe achieve exactly what you want, but there are other doors that you can open in order to do that. So I commend you for that because some companies are purely profit driven and they're not thinking about ways to educate the larger community. And I think this is very nice. And I had a second point. Just the fact that you think so much, to me, comes out very clearly. And I think that's really, Robert and I are thinkers, and we think about stuff almost to a, pain, almost to a point it hurts sometimes. And so, but it's nice to see other people thinking. And <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because I think it's really nice. And I hope we haven't lost that as people, because there's so much to be gained from that. And I can just talking to you now and hearing how your group works on things and knowing that there's this is just such a big evolution and that you're willing to try it not knowing the outcome. I think that's really nice. To add to your point, I like to think, I like to overthink. And we yeah. as a group, I, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's exp exponentially. I think what is just very important as well for us to remind is to do something. Yeah. If we only think about the issue, and look at it from always from different yes. angles and this is not perfect this is not perfect yes we will not achieve anything at the end yeah it's the action that has yeah, to yeah mm -hmm. it has to be both right you have to yes. be aware of, of why you're doing something mm. but there's always a potential negative outcome or some things you don't you didn't think about yeah well we said that because we um sponsored a tree planting day um a while ago and someone wrote to us and said like do you think this is going to help? <laughs> and I thought, okay, I just, I had to take a deep breath because I was really like, I had a very a visceral reaction to this. And then what made it for us very impactful was the fact that one tree meant something to one person. And that one tree was representative of so much on an individual level. And I think that that's where we, we say one tree, one book, one action has the ability to just cause ripples. And that's why we are doing this because we really believe in that. I think if if we don't have if we don't see it from action like you said, then if we all sit and do nothing and we're passive, then nothing happens. A comment from the audience. I think what you've said is very important and I think you've mentioned about Patagonia is also very important. I think the biggest issue I'm, we're having today is not at all from the companies that are small, SMEs. It's the problem that bigger companies are speaking too much of the good they are doing and not of the gaps that they need to fill or cover. Like for instance, Tony's Chocolate Only, The Chocolate Company, or Patagonia. These companies are very aware that the situations are not good outside. They are in that business and they know that they have to address it. But it is a systematic issue that, just like you said, but you know, have to make a profit. Mm -hmm. Now the Nestle's and the Unilever's are not even able to admit that their chocolate is coming from slavery because there is no source of chocolate without slavery. So by saying we've eliminated is not something truthful. Mm -hmm. But saying we have to still have chocolate because you want chocolate, we're doing our best, but it's not 100% in our control. I think that messaging is what we as public need to hear more. Because as we as consumers buy, we think it's green product. It's a sustainable product, but it isn't. So we buy it with the level of awareness. And so maybe we become a little bit more conscious as a consumer, honestly, because the seller has been a little bit more honest. Yes. 
And there's more transparency in the whole process, which I think is really important. A comment from the audience. Everyone is doing their business and consuming at a level of awareness that nothing is perfect. Yeah, it's not only on the consumer, it's also on the producer. Yeah. And within that, there are so many other questions, like how did we get here? And how do you break down a system that has become so capital focused and has become how people make their livelihoods? But that's a really very valid point. A question from the audience. I was in France on holiday in October, and my daughter and I ate ice cream, and it would be eaten in a tub like that or in a cone, and I chose a cone. Could you imagine that you would have a perhaps in a marketplace, a kiosk where you could offer the public a cone of your product? So yeah, we when we started, we had two pop-ups, two pop-up gelaterias in Basel. We come again to the capital. For us, we are, when we found it, we were students. I finished my, my studies in the spring, but two, uh, two of our main team is, are still studying. So for us, the seasonality of ice cream was very nice. And to answer the question, a gelateria costs, or the loan, is the whole year. So what do you do in winter? And we did not have the capacity to do that. So yet, and afterwards, absolutely. I love, I love a good waffle. I hate this, this, these paper cones. They, they really, they go, my, but a nice waffle, absolutely. It was just a glance in the future. Mm. Absolutely. Maybe do it as well ourselves. You know, about that possibility? No, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think the, the charm of an ice cream in a cone. It would make a good advertisement for you. Absolutely. Yeah. But then as well, to be aware with food, that's nice about ice cream. You should not get the main part of your caloric intake through ice cream. Really not recommendable. <laughs> and I'm not part of the sugar lobby, but... <laughs> yeah. It's just, I mean, it's always deciding, as I said, the cone is the energy as well. Again, right? Like, just like that. And just to find the, the, the balance. So if it rains, we were at Tension Festival. So Tension is an um, electronic festival. And... We had the hypothesis that people that might be slightly drunk on a techno <laughs> festival are interested in ice cream. This was the hypothesis. And we went there and for two days it rained oh, straight. Okay. We had cones with us because we didn't want to produce waste. You know what happens when rain meets cones? <laughs> Not that well, things. So, <laughs> once again, and you have to eat it quickly. <laughs> absolutely, but, but unfortunately, when you just have it's pouring rain yes. and you have the package within the cones, and I cannot stand with with the, with the umbrella to just protect it. Yeah. Where do you get the cream from? Here from the region, we work with Miba. So this is a local uh, association on it's a Genossenschaft cooperation of um, regional farmers, and here we get the dairy and the, the cream. And I think, as far as I know, this is organic. Mm. We buy organic, yeah. So it's from here. It's again, once again, with the brutally local to really source it from here. So you make gelato, not ice cream. You don't use yes. eggs. We do use eggs. You use yeah. eggs, okay. Yeah, yeah. The creamy texture. So yeah, here in Switzerland, I think, oh, now you ask. It's difficult, so it depends on the level of fat in the cream or in the... In the produce or in the ice cream, it depends what you have to call it and whatnot. So from and so we use eggs because what you think is or gelato in the classic sense is that you put it in the machine, you let it out, and then instantly you know, you see the toppings and it's quite soft, right? It's, right? And this is ice cream that has been poured or made quite fresh in the same day. That's why it's not at minus eighteen degrees, but around minus twelve. We produce the ice cream like that. Stays which stays and as well our large bidons that we have as well for the ice cream for the bicycle we do it at minus 18 so it's flat it's not because you then can cover it and you can you can store it and it has a longer shelf life because especially with the gelato with the soft one it depends that it, in the evening i mean it always depends on your philosophy that you just throw it away i like soft ice i think it's quite fun but you cannot keep that so if you produce soft ice and you we all know this the thing, whatever is in the, in the tank, yeah. at the end of the day, you have to throw it away. Mm -hmm. I do have a question. By being so brutally local, basically your market is Baselstadt and Baselland. Yes, that is our initial. And now the question for ourselves is, do we expand <laughs> our now quite strict philosophy? We do not have, not in the nearest sense, we reach full market potential here in the region. 
we might have to go Swiss wide or we might want to go. And it's always a question, right? So if it's, what is the idea? What is the claim now? We, I thought about changing the claim of brutally local ice cream because it can be in the way, in the sense of, right, we have to make profit. So we have to reach financial sustainability that people who work here, because it's a job, it's not our passion project on a, on a Saturday, we have to pay salaries. And wonderfully enough in Baselstadt, it's a minimal salary of 2250, and that's around 4,200, which is very important. So we might have to either change that or people don't realize that brutally local means really extremely local. You have to be less brutal. Yeah. <laughs> and quite a few people, especially in the beginning, came to us and they did not like the term because it was aggressive to them. For others, it was just a bit provocative. Whenever someone approaches us, that's good, right? Because mm -hmm. you gain the tension and we live in a time where attention is valuable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Does anyone have any other questions? Because then we're going to do a quick lightning round with you and just ask you a few questions. Okay. And whatever comes to mind, Oliver, okay? Do you have anything else? Uh, I think no, no, we're no, no. Okay. Not at the moment. Okay, so what is the favorite ice cream flavor that you have produced so far? Chocolate. Okay, good. Oh, he's quick. I'm not as fast as you. Okay, great. Um, do you believe that one person, one organization has the power to impart positive change? Depending on how big of a change, but yes. What is the best thing about being an entrepreneur? Being out of the comfort zone. Oh, I like that. Okay. Um, what impact do you hope to have on the world? Me personally? Yeah. So I would like that people know that I am there for them hmm. and to be able to show love. Hmm, that's nice. Okay. What, um, what's your favorite book? My favorite book used to be Eragon <laughs> as a child, mm -hmm. so a fantasy novel. I would say now, so many. It's a hard um, question. It's a little The meaty. coffee at the end of the... I don't only know the German. You can say in German. Yeah, yeah. but it's, a, it's about, I think, a hedge fund manager that sort of gets lost in a diner and finds himself. And it's quite a lovely... It's, I, I, in German, it's saying, das Kaffee am Rande der Welt. Okay. Hmm. It makes me think of a similar book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. <laughs> but I don't know your book, but I'm thinking. Okay. Where do you hope to see love go in the future? I know we kind of alluded to that, but if you had a dream of where it would go. I would love to be able to support five people the all year around and to be able to pay wages or salary that, that is financially sustainable. Mm -hmm. And out of that, I don't know what else. But that would be if I could be part of an organization that created that for five people for 12 months a year because we were able only to buy to pay us as founders six months a year during the peak time and if i can achieve that with this project that would mean a lot to me mm -hmm. that's awesome and then this is the last question is what would you tell someone just starting a business or pursuing a wild dream i have a plan and be able to change it all the time. To be, to be able to, yeah. I think you have to have a plan to start with and then to be able to, to not be, yeah, to be adapt. Mm -hmm. Because that is something as well we struggle or we struggled because this is our head, right? It's ego. And mm -hmm. to maybe let the ego aside and say, okay, how can we, it's not a perfect road, obviously. So yeah, mm -hmm. adaptation. Okay. Where can people find you? Like, how would they, if they haven't had one of your products, where can they find it? Are you, do you have a website, an Instagram account? We do have a website. It's love.ch. And our Instagram, the same. It's, the name is sometimes a bit difficult on the internet, but we do not offer any okay. services in that sense. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> It's uh, November now, so we have to wait a bit. Um, there are a few restaurants and sh uh, shops that still have us, but in March 2024, it will start again. We aim to have 100 or 80 B2B customers in the region. So that is our, that is our mission for next year. Uh, you can find us at Manor in Klein Basel, um, Kult Bäckerei. Mm -hmm. So the loveliest places in Basel during <laughs> summer. They should have us. Nice. That's our... <laughs> That's your plan. Yeah. Good. Or and still have us. Oh. Very good. And to end today, we just want to say ways, a few tips and tricks for preventing food waste in our own homes as individuals, and then a few resources, which we'll hand out to you um, in a moment. But do you have like a few tips for preventing food waste at home? First of all, planning mm -hmm. and cover it. Cover your stuff. 
the fruits and vegetables, whatever is in the fridge, because it just makes it. And if I, for example, the banana is the perfect example. I had a, quite a dark banana at home and I was too lazy to do anything. So I just put it in the freezer because then if I ever use it again, I sort of take the peel off. I could have could have been better. But yeah, the freezer, I think the freezer is for preventing food waste, especially with fruits and vegetables. It's quite nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Something else, too, is I know we talked a little bit about it, but the sell by date, the use by date. But sometimes that gets rid of our own um, intellect. (laughs) So if it doesn't look bad and it doesn't smell bad, it's probably okay to eat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. I think your sensories are very, I mean, we are trained to not die by the food. (laughs) (laughs) So I think tasting it, smelling it and feeling it well, yeah, that's, yeah. that's probably the best yeah. you can do to prevent food waste. Totally. Is it still good? Yeah. And to get creative with your meals and what you use if something is getting close to going bad, to be creative with that. Um, and then a few things that maybe you know as well, but we did a bit of research on this. Are you familiar with the Food Save Basel Stadt program or initiative? Yes. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. that's kind of nice, right? Yeah, it's Swiss wide. It's I think it's the most important NGO or non non state player in Switzerland regarding the prevention of food food loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There are a few organizations: the the Food Waste um, CH Food Sharing Basel, and then the United Against Waste. But then there are some apps. Do you use any of these apps? I mean, sometimes I use Too Good To Go. Okay. Oh, um, I'm not digging into it too much because I'm not sure how sustainable it really is as a concept. Mm-hmm. Because whenever you have the demand and you want to fulfill demand, I'm not sure how that works, but maybe maybe it does. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's great. You can you can be sustainable a bit more on your wallet and sometimes it's nice. Mm-hmm. I really like Espar here in Basel. Not sure if you know it. First, it's right next to university, and it's um, they collect um, pastries oh, yeah, on the yeah, night. Yeah. And I mean, like like day old pastries. And Absolutely, yeah. and to buy a, a nice sandwich from a good bakery, but instead of seven francs, I paid three fifty. My student wand was screaming out of luck. So yeah, that's that's very nice. Other things, yeah, yeah no, no. Okay, good. There's another one called Super Cook app, and it just tells you, it helps you come up with recipe ideas with what you have at the house. And then there's another organization we just found online. It's Second, S-E-C-E-N-D, mm-hmm. C-H, and they source food that I think would otherwise go to waste that you can buy online. You can go and select it. Are you familiar with them? I think I saw an ad. Okay. I think they're more towards storing and storage, so dry. Yes, yeah. more dry ingredients, yeah. drugstore items, but they're trying to prevent food waste in that regard as well. So those are just a few tips that we have. And before we close, are there any other questions or anything we neglected to answer? A question from the audience. Hi, Jean. When you're working, do you work with gloves on? Obviously, yes. Yeah. So the... The food law, or let's say pr- food production law in Switzerland, is very strict. It's quite cooperative in the sense of that you work together with the with the government. But we have um, they do tests in the laboratory, and we got uh, even recommendations how we can improve. So because sort of um, traces of nuts are probably found in all foods. So we just, especially if you're in a production, we do not have nuts in our ice cream due to allergic uh, reasons, but still they found, but as well in other things. So yes, we have a hygiene concept. We execute that very strictly because we in a um, Versicherung is insurance. So in an insurance way, if we, I'm sorry to say that, if we fuck up and someone has food poisoning mm. and we did not, did everything, that we could have. We personally, or our production, is responsible personally, which is different than the rest of the insurance part for a company, where the company itself is responsible for the actions. So there, there is a personal responsibility. Mm. And to give, uh, to do tests in the laboratory and to do recommendations, and they they are quite strict in, the, in whole Switzerland. Where is your production? So we produce in Grossbasel, in near Luzern Ring beneath a um, retirement home. They have a large kitchen and we have some freezer spaces around the corner and a dry storage in Klein Basel. Where does the name come from? From love. 
Yeah. We initially we were called the Alibi Collective because haha. <laughs> so fun. We just had our old Alibi to do stuff, and then we start with Alibi ice cream or Alibi glossed, which is wrong because it's not. Uh, the produce itself. And then we were talking to a friend about the idea and it's sort of a teenager, post teenager gag, instead of saying love, it's with love. Because in Switzerland or in Swiss German, you don't say brunch, you say brunch and you don't say lunch, you say lunch. And out of that came came love. And he just told um, her, yeah, we do, we made so much love. And then we realized, hey, why not? It's a passion project. A comment from the audience. Okay, so I wanted to add something about food waste. When it is inevitable that you have to waste food, think about composting. Mm. That is the only thing I can say. If you really can't bring yourself to eat that wobbly carrot, I would personally suggest to just make a soup with it. Then if it is wobbly or not, who cares? Think about it. I'm going to chop it up and dump it into the composting. That's the last resort. Thank you. Yeah, that's very true. So thank you for coming today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very thank much. You, yeah. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, we appreciate it. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to be awesome and share this podcast with your friends. Click subscribe, rate, and review. Do you have a story to tell? An organization you'd like to tell the world about? We love to hear from you and our global community. So please get in touch with us at reviven.com. That's R-E-V-Y-V-E-N.com. Or send us an email at reviven.com at gmail.com.